Hi, can you hear me okay? Can someone just reply that you can hear me, please? Thank you, Laverne. It's good to be with everyone again. Man, we're reunited all again. We may have more people joining us. I've got Our Lady of Guadalupe in the back here. So um, I'll be uh, just uh, asking for her intercession today as we go forward with this topic today. So we'll give people a few minutes to, to log in while I say hi to a few people. And uh, we'll get started. Thanks for joining me tonight. Hi, Gina, Rosemary, uh, Lynette, Lori, Sarah, Laverne, Kasha, Karen, good to see you here, and uh, Rita and everyone else. I see a bunch more that uh, maybe aren't registered uh, here, won't show up. Hi, Nancy. Nancy, would you mind taking a few notes as I talk? I hope you don't mind typing some stuff in. Hi, Linda. Well, good to see everyone. We'll try our best to uh, keep things civil throughout this conversation, I hope. Um, so if everyone, hi, uh, Chris and Jana, good to see you guys and, uh, and everyone else joining. Um, you know, throughout this discussion, this can be one of those topics that as we talk, it gets a little bit tricky. And uh, I just want people to know that if you do have comments to make about particular candidates or anything like that, uh, that you would hold off from putting them into the live chat comments, please. Because otherwise, it, it just serves as a distraction. People start to get, you know, anxious and comment back. And uh, so just let's just uh, keep particular names and stuff out of, out of the comments, if you don't mind. Um, I don't really have a moderator, so I just want to make sure that we uh, keep things as uh, civil as possible. So I got our lady in the back. So um, I got her on an angle so you don't see all the lights reflecting, but uh, let's get started. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, we're here to talk to you and, and be with you and to learn from you um, about voting. This is such a confusing time and such a confusing issue uh, to kind of discuss and, and to uh, to rest with. Sometimes, Lord, we are completely restless with this topic. And so our hearts are restless till they rest in you. Lord, give us the foundation, the grace, and the peace to discuss this uh, well according to your will tonight. We love you and praise you. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So tonight I'm uh, in my office uh, here at the National Shrine of the Little Flower Basilica in Royal Oak. And uh, we're going to just chat about the uh, upcoming election. How do we vote as Catholics? Not so much. We're not going to come up with, you know, vote for this person or vote for that person, but giving you principles to guide you. Right. So this is challenging to talk about. It's challenging to receive. You're going to maybe be challenged on some issues that uh, maybe was, you know, maybe it's new for you. Maybe it's difficult for you. Uh, maybe you always had a form conscience that was opposite of church teaching. Uh, who knows where everyone else is at? Um, but it's good to see so many here. I see Tom, Dolores, so many other. Oh, I see Char there. It's so good to see everyone. Uh, so whomever else wants to join us as we go, terrific. If not, no big deal. Um, Tonight, I want you guys to know that I don't, I'm not particularly sorting, supporting any candidate. I'm not uh, suggesting that you should. Um, but there are principles that hopefully will lead us to clarity, right? The clarity that we're seeking in this election. So, um, hi, uh, Mary and Julia. Thanks be to God. So, <laughs> um, you know, as a priest, I'm also called, as we all are, to be a watchman for the Lord, right? To to call things out that maybe culturally are sick or not leading us to full life in the kingdom with Jesus. And so that's part of my job as I talk tonight. So I'm going to speak frankly about things. I hope to speak clearly about them. 
so that when you leave this talk, there will be no ambiguity about many of the topics, right? Um, so we all have to stand before the judgment seat of the Lord. And me especially, I have to say, I spoke your truth or I didn't, Lord. And so I want to be a, a priest after Jesus' heart, not my own. So I'm going to have to make sure that I'm crystal clear on the principles of Catholic voting for each one of you, okay? This is going to include forming our worldview as Catholic Christians. It also includes cooperation with evil. Um, why we have grounds to discuss these things, right? We have grounds as Catholic priests to, to discuss these things, not only in civil law, but also in church documents and law. So, you know, we have to, people often say, I'm going to vote my conscience, right? But we have to make sure that that conscience is well-formed. And the well-formedness of it can't be well-formed according to, you know, uh, what I always wanted to do or well-formed according to what my great aunt Lucy says I should do. It's well-formed according to our Catholic Christian worldview, right? And that worldview, if we don't have that as a firm foundation, we're not going to understand this topic. The firm foundation has to be that we were hopelessly enslaved to sin, to evil. And when we became complicit with evil, it became sin for us, right? So evil is one thing. It just means not good or not God. It's actions that occur outside of God. Now, when we do those actions, it's called sin. And every sin has a social effect. I don't care how private it is, how whatever. It, it always has a social effect because it affects you. It affects the spiritual realm and it affects the people we come in contact with, right? So we have to make sure that we always keep this in mind that sin, we were hopelessly trapped in the evil that was ushered in at the fall. We've talked about this many times. And so we need a savior and that savior is Jesus Christ, right? He came, up, number one, out of obedience to the Father, and number two, out of love for us. This is so important for us because Jesus shows us that the way to love him is to be obedient to him. And so as we form our consciences as Catholic Christians, we look for, Lord, what do you say we should do for life? Because we are made for you. Um, you know, the forming my conscience or voting my conscience, sometimes people have fallen into these kind of cultural, like, I don't know, they're just like little catchphrases that don't really mean much, you know, like, what would Jesus do? Well, he would love. Well, what is love, right? Um, what does that mean? Or um, don't judge me, right? I, I'm not going to judge someone. Well, we have to make judgments of reason. It's called discernment. We have to discern whether someone's words and actions match, whether their words and actions are good according to God's law or whether they're evil and whether or not by doing them or by participating in them on some level, including my vote, right? Um, I will somehow be participating in that evil and so incur sin on myself. And that sin can both be mortal and venial even with participation in evil or cooperation with evil. How have we formed our consciences? That's the question today, right? So we're going to do a little formation up front. Um, have we been reading scripture and tradition? Have we been participating in reading the catechism? What does the church say on things? Read the catechism like a manual. That's what it is. You can search in the back in the index for any topic you want to discuss or think about or hear what the church teaches on it. This includes, you know, um, it includes same-sex marriage, abortion. It includes just war, racism. It includes everything. Just look it up. It's right there at your fingertips. So if you haven't been forming your conscience according to the catechism and reading scripture, we're already a little behind, right? St. Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, says our citizenship is in heaven, right? When we go to vote, we're, we're not looking for the Savior, I hope, right? <laughs> we don't think that one candidate or another is the Savior. But probably one candidate or another or one party or another 
more closely aligns with the values and the teachings of the Catholic Church and what Jesus says we should do. So it's important for us to make judgments to determine that. This is when the formation begins, right? So I'm not judging you, and I won't be judging you about anything um, here tonight at all, nor ever, right? I don't judge the person. We never judge the person, but we always have to judge the words and the actions as to whether or not they, they're consistent with Jesus or they're inconsistent with what Jesus says. If we have a vague concept of God is love and we think that that just means let everyone do whatever they want without any consequences, then we don't have the right concept of love. We're wrong, right? So we need to reform our mind to understand, to seek to understand what did Jesus teach and how should we vote? How should we discern voting as Catholics? Our citizenship is in heaven. We shouldn't expect perfect happiness here, but we should work towards it. And that it starts with our vote. It starts with charity with our neighbor. You know, we are called to vote. We must vote. We have an obligation to vote. That's what the catechism says. I'm going to be talking to you tonight about many topics of faith and morals. And here's what the church says about that. Because there are some people who say, can, can you as a priest talk about, can you as a priest talk about abortion? Can you talk about the sanctity of marriage between one man and one woman um, for life? Can you talk about that? Isn't that political or getting into politics? Nope. That's being a Catholic priest. <laughs> we have full jurisdiction to talk about anything related to faith and morals. And if faith and morals span into politics, we have full right and full reign to talk about that. Listen to this. Um, you know, in first of all, that Christ endowed the church's shepherds with the charism of infallibility in matters of faith and morals, right? Um, this is, I wouldn't be considered a shepherd in this case because they're talking about the Pope and the bishops. Really, either the bishop making a solemn or the Pope making a solemn declaration or the bishops in conjunction with the Pope making a solemn declaration. And so, first of all, they can make infallible claims on faith and morals. Done. I, as a priest, can talk about those things, and I do. So, the next thing is, I want to read this little quote from Gaudium et Spes, and this is a church document that came out of like Vatican II in 1960s-ish, so mid-1960s. The church herself makes use of temporal things insofar as her own mission requires it. She, for her part, does not place her trust in the privileges offered by civil authorities. I'm sorry, Nancy, it's Gaudium et Spes number 76. She does not place her trust in the privileges offered by civil authority. That would even be tax-exempt status, right? She will even give up the exercise of certain rights which, which have been legitimately acquired if it becomes clear that their use will cast doubt on the sincerity of her witness or that new ways of life demand new methods. In other words, that, you know, we're not doing this for, for like accolades from the state. We're doing this because we love Jesus and we want to follow what he says to do. Um, it's only right that at all times and in all places, the church should have true freedom to preach the faith, to teach her social doctrine, to exercise her role freely among men, and also to pass moral judgment in those matters which regard public order when the fundamental rights of a person or the salvation of souls require it in this she should make use of all the means which accord with the gospel and which correspond to the general good according to the diversity of times and circumstances. In other words, it's fully within our rights to talk about these types of things that I'll be talking about today. Obviously, without judging anyone who's done these types of things, but calling them to God's merciful love, right? That's the key. So, some of the things, you know, this is about salvation of souls. That's the whole point is about salvation of souls. Why would we bother talking about anything less, right? I have no interest 
and talking about like during during election time, like what the latest score was on something that is not consequential for salvation, right? We're coming up to something that's absolutely essential. We have to make sure we're on the right page here. First, we need a foundational formation in Catholic teaching, right? That Jesus came, suffered and died for us out of obedience and love for us. Love, obedience to the Father, love for us. He came and set us free. He established his kingdom, the kingdom of life, right? Not death. Death, darkness, sin, suffering, pain, illness, all these terrible things came through the dominion of darkness. Remember, dominion of darkness, kingdom of God, kingdom of life, freedom, right? Not just freedom to do whatever I want, but freedom from the consequences of the things I've done. So first we have to discover and launch from the truth. Get those Bibles out. Read a little bit on the page every day. Learn his voice. We've talked about this so many times. Read the catechism, right? Now, we also have to develop a, a solid foundation of Catholic teachings on cultural concepts, right? For example, if I say, if, if we just read that thing from Gaudium et Spes, and it said, we can make a judgment on anything. I thought we weren't supposed to judge. We're not supposed to judge people. We are supposed to judge words and actions, though. It's called discernment of spirits, right? We are called to say, was that action consistent with what Jesus said or not, right? Is abortion consistent with what Jesus says or not? We have to think about these things, not judging the person as good or evil or going to hell or going to heaven. We don't make those judgments but we do make judgments all the time on whether or not I should eat the sugar cereal or the healthy one, right? This is a judgment of reason. We can make judgments on these types of things based on whether or not they are consistent with Jesus and his teachings. So judgment has to be understood, number one. We can make judgments. Jesus calls us to make discernment judgments. Number two, we have to understand love. That Jesus said very clearly, the first commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. We have to love God first in obedience so that we learn the relationship rules with him. And then we know how to love our neighbor. Is it loving to let your neighbor fall to his death? I don't think so, right? And we might think of it like the issue of, you know, sexuality, right? We might think like, well, they're just living together outside of marriage. You know, it's not like they're dying. Isn't that exactly the trick of the garden? Did Adam and Eve die in the moment they ate the fruit, right? But they did die spiritually. They died instantly spiritually. They were cut off from the Lord in an intimate communion that they once had, right? We have to see with new eyes to understand that loving our neighbor means correcting our neighbor at times. It means telling them the good news about Jesus, that we don't have to live in this world hopelessly trapped in sin, that we can't do it on our own ingenuity and humanity, that we need a Savior. We need Jesus, the Savior, to come and help us. We can't do it. And if we have the perspective that love is going to help us and all this, yeah, God will help you. But first we have to repent. First we have to realize that the relationship with him requires not cheating on him and his relationship rules. And then we understand and we see clearly. We have the wooden beam move from our eyes so we can see the splinter in our brothers more clearly. Where have we tried to be God? And how do we get rid of it, right? So, Rita asked a question about our judgments, same as free will? Yes. So, we have to use our free will or we don't really have the ability to judge or discern, right? Which do I choose? Hmm, right? That's a judgment. You're making a judgment call. You're, you're reasoning the ev through the evidence, the propositions to make a conclusion, so we need free will that's inherently involved in making a judgment. So thank you.
Next, we have to talk about tolerance, right? Tolerance. Do we just tolerate sin? I mean, think about in Revelation chapter 2, Jesus actually says in the vision to John, he says, you know, he's speaking to this, like, you know, diocese maybe of Thyatira or Theatira. And it says this, he says, but I hold this against you, that you tolerated the Jezebel among you. She, you let her practice her idolatry that led everyone according to the loss of their hearts. I hold it against you that you tolerated this, right? What's happening to the open-mindedness that we thought we, that Jesus once had, that we could do whatever we wanted? And there'd be no consequences. That's a lie. It's a lie of the evil one. And we have to get the story right or we haven't formed our conscience right. Judgment. We're called to make judgments of reason. Love involves loving him first and following his commands so we know how to love our neighbor as ourselves. And three, tolerance. He doesn't tolerate evil. Most especially, he doesn't tolerate mortal sin, right? But him, good and evil, mixed together like a combustible gas and oxygen, right? <laughs> so they don't. They don't mix. So we also have to look at justice, right? It's giving someone their due. What's due to God but everything, right? Um, when, we, when we have gone astray into sin, we ask for his mercy by repentance. We have to repent. It's not just a foregone conclusion, right? He's not just sitting there without our repentance, without our acknowledgement of saying, hey, I messed up, I want to come home, um, to say, whatever, you can just do whatever you want. I'm just merciful, and I'll just love you no matter what. He will love us always. But will he forgive us no matter what? No, we need to come and ask for it with mercy, with repentance. Ask for his mercy. Justice is giving him that due. What's due to him is our obedience and love first, and then to our neighbor second, right? Love God first, obey him, participate in the relationship of love with him first, and then we get into loving our neighbor as ourself properly. And that's where we start. We're obliged to vote. In Catechism of the Catholic Church, so CCC 2239 and 2240, it says this in 2239, it is the duty of citizens to contribute along with the civil authorities to the good of society in a spirit of truth, justice, solidarity, and freedom. The love and service, etc. So basically, we have a duty to participate in the citizenship of our particular area, we are obligated to vote. We're under a moral obligation, right? This is crazy. Maybe some of us have never heard this before. Maybe this is a difficult thing, but we need to understand this so very clearly. That first of all, we're called for the to seek the common good based on our Catholic Christian worldview, right? Not based on the world's worldview. Not based on Satan's worldview, right? but on the Catholic Christian worldview that we've formed, hopefully, our consciences over time so that our conscience gets stung when something is, is, is maybe as crude or as shocking as abortion gets mentioned. We go, whoa, 63 million kids since, you know, Roe versus Wade? What? Maybe it's higher. Maybe it's 68. I didn't look it up. But um, that, that should sting us. That shouldn't be like, you know, good and take a drag off the cigarette. You know, that, that means there's something wrong with us, right? There's something right when we get kind of hurt by that. Like that, that's sad. That's scary. Um, you know, if, when we talk about this particular type of issue that we have actually, we have an obligation to work for the moral good, for the common good of society. But the common good isn't just like a calculus, right? It's not just a percentage like, oh, well, you know, 60% of people think that abortion is okay. So that must be the common good. No. Every intrinsic evil is not, that is allowed to persist in a society is not working for the common good, right? 
What about the millions of people that have perished systematically? Is, was it for their common good? No. We, we have to understand that there is um, a particular weight and a particular, um, yeah, I guess just weight attached to particular issues, right? Um, the common good uh, is the, according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1906, 1906. By common good is to be understood the sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. So it's um, a group or as individuals that we can reach our fulfillment more fully and more easily. Taking examples, you know, um, where sin is, is at play, how are people reaching their the fulfillment, right? If they're not even allowed to live, how are they reaching their fulfillment when they're maybe systematically enslaved? How are people we reaching their fulfillment as a group and individuals when they are captured as like sex slaves and human trafficking? No, we have to work for the common good, right? The common good, not the common evil. And if it systematically involves the death of a group, then it's an evil right? Or the death of an individual. It's always an intrinsic evil, right? When an individual, an innocent individual is killed, that's intrinsically evil. It's not a common good. It never will be. No matter how we try to explain the circumstances away, it never will be. There are certain things that Pope Benedict XVI in 2006 said that there are certain non-negotiables in the in the moral life. You know, the non-negotiables, you know, first of all, he says that there's a particular weight for moral issues, right? And um, this is Cardinal Ratzinger, and he was, this is from uh, a document on the worthiness to receive Holy Communion. And he says this, not all moral issues have the same moral weight as abortion and euthanasia. Whoa. So already we hear just in this one example um, that's very clear, and he goes on from there, um, that even in issues of like capital punishment and other things, there, there's, there's kind of an area where the weight can be adjusted a little bit. But he says that not all moral issues have the same moral weight as abortion and euthanasia. Done. We already know then that there's kind of a hierarchy of needs and a hierarchy of priorities then, right? Um, we, we can see that very clearly just in some of the writings of the popes that they're trying to show us, like Jesus is, that first of all, we have to focus on, um, he says, that there are three major categories of kind of non-negotiables in the Catholic Christian spiritual life. Three non-negotiables. The first one is the sanctity of human life from conception to natural death. It's a non-negotiable in Catholic moral theology. The sanctity of human life from conception to natural death. The second one is recognition and promotion of the natural structure of the family. Let me summarize that. The sanctity of marriage, of a sacramental lifelong union between one man and one woman and the family. The sacramental lifelong union of one man and one woman and the sanctity of the family. That is number two. Number one, the sanctity of life. Number two, the sanctity of the sacramental lifelong covenant between one man and one woman in marriage and the family. The second one, or the third one, is the protection of the right of parents to educate. In other words, religious liberty, religious freedom, right? So the third one is religious liberty and religious freedom. So these are the three non-negotiables that Pope Benedict XVI said. Um, I forget the document. Let me see if I have that here. Oh, it was, uh, it was an address to the European Parliament, uh, parliaments 
And uh, he described these as the absolute non-negotiables of Catholic moral theology. And so we have to pay attention to these when we talk about the principles of Catholic voting, right? Um, you know, we're trying, he's trying to draw out that there are certain non-negotiable aspects to the common good um, that we should always be on the watch for. And these are fundamental, typically they're the fundamental and unalienable rights, right? In other words, with respect to abortion, let's just, let's just cover the sanctity of life first, right? Um, you know, we have, we have like this, this very clear idea within, um, within just natural law, right? We kind of have the idea, we have an understanding that, that the sanctity of life, the right to live is primary, right? Now, Often people at this point will start to kind of glaze over and get a little frustrated because we think, oh, we're one issue voters. And um, or they try or people will often try to, like, expand the definition of what it means to be pro-life. Right. They'll say, well, what about the quality of life? Right. What about quality of life? Like, you know, uh, what about the, the you know, quality of life to have a great paying job and everything? Yeah, that, that would be nice, right? That would be great. But that's called liberty in the pursuit of happiness, right? The first one is life. And we have to make sure we're very clear on these terms, right? Because otherwise, the idea of life gets drowned into, just kind of submersed into the quality of life. And we kind of make everything equal. When clearly Pope Benedict said, no, no abortion and euthanasia carry a greater weight. In other words, some moral evils are intrinsically evil by themselves. No circumstance, nothing can justify them, right? They're just in themselves evil, and we should avoid these at all costs. So sometimes as I say this and I talk about this topic, I'm very aware that there are maybe some women uh, and maybe even some men who have uh, had an abortion and um, and they're heartbroken, they're devastated, they maybe don't feel very much hope. And so I want to take a moment now and at the end of this to say, this is precisely why I want to say this to you, because God loves you so immeasurably and his mercy is so much greater than any sin you could have or did commit that repenting and coming home to him, he's happy to receive you that this is not the end. The end is not to just suddenly say, um, you know, I'm hopelessly lost, right? No, no. We, you might have terrible pains and regret, but we can, you can heal, right? And the Lord forgives when you repent and come home to him. He's waiting for you. So just trust that. Don't worry about that so much as try to repent and come home, right? This is so beautiful. Now, uh, when we talk about things like, um, when we talk about abortion, we have to be very clear here that the right to life is absolutely primary and has a greater weight than any other issue. Are Catholics one issue voters? I think we'll cease to be, you know, a major proponent of abortion when abortion ceases to exist. <laughs> so, you know, we're not a one issue voter. We care about many, many issues, but we also acknowledge the weight of different moral conditions and moral evils and moral good things, you know, morally good things, right? So when we start to talk about the right to life, um, Many things have been said about this. Um, some people have asked me very clearly, you know, that the right to life, does that mean that we always have to vote for the pro-life candidate? And we're going to unpack that right now, okay? Um, but the right to life is really foundational to the common good of any society, right? We can't, we can't sit there and say... Um, you know, we can't sit there and just say, you know, like, um, you know, we have a basically morally good society, except that we, you know, systematically kill a group of people. <laughs> how, 
how, how is that working for the common good? You know, it, there's something majorly off there. And so we can't really say that we're working for the common good until we kind of start to really strenuously um, talk about abortion and resist it. Um, Cardinal Ratzinger, you know, first of all, if we've committed an abortion, if we've had an abortion, we killed the baby, right? Um, the, then we have to understand that we're guilty of a grave sin, that this is a mortal sin, right? It's, it's the stopping of, it's the murder, right, of, of a child, of a hum, innocent human life. Who could be more innocent than a developing baby? Nothing was ever done by them. They didn't, you know, pick on people or, or trip people or, you know, I don't know, hurt them. Um, they're always innocents. And so if they're always innocent, then, um, then, we have to, then we have to look at that and say, okay, this is always, this is an intrinsic evil. By its very nature, it's wrong. Um, so there was a concept that uh, someone once told me while I was working at Oakwood Hospital. And this consultant told us that um, what you permit, you promote. What you permit, you promote. And I thought, oh, man, you know, what I permit in my department with behaviors by employees, I'm kind of promoting it. And, and so basically, if we were to say, I'm permitting, uh, I'm going to permit this abortion, or I'm going to pay for it, or um, I'm going to drive you, or I've encouraged you to do this, right? Or I've forced you to do this. Oh, boy. All of these things, we would have to say, we either have participated ourselves directly, and so it would be basically, if we had full knowledge and full consent of the will, then we committed a mortal sin, right? However, like let's say you drove the car, or let's say you, um, you paid for it, but you didn't have it. Let's say you encouraged it. Oh boy, right? So now suddenly we have to talk about a concept called uh, cooperation with evil, okay? Cooperation with evil. So maybe I didn't, you know, commit the abortion. Maybe I didn't rob the bank, but I drove the give, getaway car. Well, I didn't hold someone at gunpoint, but I was definitely cooperating with that evil, right? Let's say that you voted for a candidate because, because they agree with abortion. Let's say you said, I stand for a woman's right to make a choice without consequences. I don't believe in choose as a thing because we can always choose. It's the choice without the consequences, really what the issue is. I, I want women to do this and I support abortion. And so I'm voting for this person who will now go and make sure that abortion gets taken care of by putting it into law. By enshrining an intrinsic moral evil into the laws which are established to uphold the common good. Now we're getting somewhere because we're starting to see, uh-oh, something has gone wrong, right? The church says that this is formal cooperation with evil. There are three levels, basically, of cooperation with evil. There's formal cooperation, which means you are a direct participant in it. There is um, material cooperation with evil. And in, within that, there are two categories, remote and proximate. So far away and close, right? So in the case of someone who says, I want abortion, I'm voting for abortion, and we're going to have abortion then you have just participated in cooperating with evil in a formal way. You are a formal cooperation participate, cooperation with evil participant. That basically means you're living in mortal sin. That's what that means. That you actually wanted it. You wanted the evil that's contrary to our Catholic Christian worldview to exist in the world and you promulgated it. That's a big problem. So voting for, say, a pro-abortion candidate would be, an in, is, would be a grave sin. 
in that case where someone has participated in the evil, cooperated with it by choosing purposely to have abortion in the world. That's what the church teaches. So mortal sin is incurred in two major categories when we actually do it and have full knowledge and full consent of the will and also formally cooperate with it, that we actually have a mind that we want this to happen in the world and we go out and, and vote for it. The other side of it is, well, what does that mean then? Does that mean that I can never vote for a pro-abortion candidate? And here's what Cardinal Ratzinger, before he became uh, Pope Benedict, said about that, okay? He said, a Catholic would be guilty of formal cooperation with evil, and so unworthy to present himself for Holy Communion or herself, right? If he or she were to deliberately vote for a candidate precisely because of the candidate's permissive stance on abortion or euthanasia. Wow. When a Catholic does not share the candidate's stance in favor of abortion or euthanasia, but votes for that candidate for other reasons, it is considered remote material cooperation with evil, which can be permitted in the presence of proportionate reasons. Whoa, let's break that down. So first of all, it's formal cooperation with evil if you purposely intend to vote for someone because of abortion, period. Okay? But he says there's a little wiggle room. It's called remote cooperation or material cooperation, right? Remote or proximate. And he says, it would be remote material cooperation if you didn't want to have that. Um, you didn't want to have abortion, but that candidate did. But here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. We have to pay attention here because right away we think, oh, okay, so I can vote for someone. Well, hang on. Let's listen to this again. It can be permitted in the presence of proportionate reasons. Proportionate reasons. What is proportionate to the killing of 63 million children? What's proportionate? Is it someone's repulsive, I don't know, uh, communication style? Is that proportionate to killing 63 million children? No, right? Um, is it proportionate to um, they want to kill um, 100 people by, by lethal injection, um, capital punishment? And so I think that's terrible. And so I'm going to vote for the pro-abortion uh, candidate. Is it proportionate? Are, in other words, do they balance each other out and maybe outweigh the one? A couple hundred, which is one human life to lose is sad, but 63 million and a million something a year, right? You know, what, what would be proportionate is the question, because we can't just take this out of context and say, oh, we can vote as long as we don't intend it. No, that's not what he said. What he said was, we need to have a proportionate reason in order for that to even apply. If there's no proportionate reason, then there's no good reason to vote for them. What would be a proportionate reason? The second coming of the Holocaust, maybe, right? That would be terrible. I hope that never happens. But that would be proportionate, right? That we would say, I don't want 10 million people to die. And so a million a year until we can figure out a new thing of through abortion, that might be okay. Comparatively, the lesser of two evils, right? Or how about both candidates support abortion and one wants to expand it and one wants to contract it? What is proportionate? The one that wants to contract it, right? So remember, we have a moral obligation to vote and we have to have and operate out of our well-formed conscience that there better be a proportionate reason, not a proportionate reason of a flare-up within us, right? Of frustration with the personality, but we have to base this on principle, right? On policy, not on personality, okay? 
I hope that that's very clear. It's this very difficult stuff. But we, in other words, if there's no proportionate, remember the weight is, there's a greater weight with abortion and euthanasia within any other issue. And it would be allowed insofar that as there is a proportionate, proportionate um, other side to the story with another candidate who is also killing 63 or a million people a year, right? The other side of this is this. What do we think of a society and a group, maybe even a party, that wants to expand, not contract, a, an intrinsic evil? For example, there is a group that wants to expand abortion into, um, into partial birth abortions, right? Does everyone know what that means? I, I hope you know what that means. I really hope you know what that means because we have to settle in the truth. We have to be grounded in the truth during this election. A partial birth abortion means that a baby is born crowning or out to its navel if its legs are out. And then it is destroyed with whatever is sticking out of the mother. That's barbaric, my friends. And there's a party that is trying to support that. That is cooperation with evil on a level that is unfathomable. This is, this is not at all something that a Catholic needs to be even considering getting involved in. I realize that as I say this, people are going to have some allergic reactions to this morally, physically, whatever. And that's okay because that's how we learn and that's how we grow together. But the first and foremost is that the sanctity of life must be upheld. It's a non-negotiable for Catholic teaching. The next thing is the sanctity of marriage, the sanctity of lifelong sacramental marriage between one man and one woman and the sanctity of the family, right? I won't get into this very much, but just know that anything that's trying to work against this particular way of marriage, whether that's with same-sex marriage whether it's with the transgender kind of lobby right now, these things make it very difficult for us to, to hear about these things. But is the party that I'm voting for, is that party or that individual increasing this or decreasing it? Or do they disagree with it, right? If they're increasing and agree with it and you participate with it and say, I think it's great. I think it's wonderful, and that's why I'm voting for him. Then that is a cooperation with a not good, right? It's a cooperation with something that Jesus did not intend. The Lord made them male and female, right? We have to understand this. As difficult as it is, as much as we love our family members who maybe struggle with certain things. Remember, same-sex attraction is not intrinsically evil. Acting on it can be and is, right? So we have to make sure that we have this, this clearly in mind. And these are difficult things. And we need help pastorally working on these things. Because, you know, who should be excluded from God's grace? Nobody. But that's why we have to preach truth to people so that they know where the good is. Because there's a darkness out there. And it is truly dark. People are walking in darkness and they think it's light. So is the candidate that I'm voting for consistent with the sanctity of marriage between one man and one woman and the upholding of the sanctity of the family? Or is that party, is that platform something different? The last thing is the non-negotiable of religious liberty. It, are we voting for someone who's trying to kind of equivocate or, or level all religions or or take away religious freedoms and rights and privileges, right? It's not really a privilege. It is a right to worship the creator, right? <laughs> it's an inalienable right to worship the creator. We, we have to understand this very clearly, that there's no state, there's no one who should tell us what we can believe or can't believe, what we, you know, like the Little Sisters of the Poor, for example, who said, we're not going to provide contraception coverage for our workers. 
because it's against our religion. And there was a group that said, we're going to fight you on this. We, don't, we want you to, to cover it. Once we get rid of the ability to live the faith and morals and worship the creator who made us, then we're in big, big, big trouble. And so is the candidate that you are considering someone who supports independence of religious institutions or someone who wants to impose upon them their own morality, their own faith, because we remember have the ability to discern and make judgment calls for our own faith and morals and to teach society how to go up in the good, not down with the evil. How am I as a Catholic Christian voter um, discovering, seeking and discovering truth? Not only the truth about the people or the, the, the foundational worldview of being a Catholic Christian, but how am I discovering the truth about the candidates? There's so much misinformation. I've heard some people say, so-and-so is a racist and so-and-so is this. And I said, oh, where's the evidence on that? And I get crickets. Well, I heard it once somewhere from someone. Okay, there's a lot of bad information out there. Are you taking the time to actually learn what, what do the candidates really stand for? Is so-and-so really a racist? Is so-and-so maybe imprudent with speech, and I wish so-and-so wouldn't say that or would say this, but their policies are good, right? Can we cut through the information that's wrong or the way that maybe they make us feel because of their, their personality quirks or problems, right? And can we get to the policies, regardless of whatever religion they claim or anything like that, can we get to the policies and say, this is a non-negotiable for the Catholic Church. I can't vote for them. Or this one is trying to uh, live these three non-negotiable teachings of the church. I can vote for them. How are you discerning it without equivocating all these terms about life, right? Racism, immigration, right? These are so important of issues but they're lower on the weight than the right to life, right? In other words, they're so important. We should work for these for the common good. We should try to get rid of racism, try to welcome the immigrant and the stranger and the widow and help the widow and the orphan. But they shouldn't take a precedence in our discernment over the non-negotiables, which we just talked about, right? Whoa, how are we discerning the weight of the issues? So focus on the policies, not the personality traits, okay? Um, let's see here. Sorry. At this point now, I'm in my notes where I'm going, holy mackerel. I'm running out of time and I got to look here. <laughs> um, you know... The reason why we make such a big deal of so many of these issues and people think we're a one issue voter is because God made us with inviolable rights, right? And with great dignity because we we're made in his image and likeness. When something takes away from that or attempts to rob us of that inherent dignity and the image and likeness of the Lord, it's a big problem to say that, the Lord, the giver of all life, right? The Lord, the giver of life, I'm going to stop by killing his gift in another or in myself through euthanasia. It's a gift. How are we, how are we discerning this well? How are we discerning this well as we go to vote? How are we looking at these principles, right? That there is a hierarchy of, of issues. That every sin has a social effect, right? So we can't just sit back and say, you know, I want to be a good law-abiding citizen and I want to be a good Catholic. And so I'm going to sit back on this election and let people who maybe aren't as law-abiding and aren't as practicing of their religion go and vote. <laughs> how is that helping the common good get out and vote and vote according 
to your um, to your dignity and according to your Catholic Christian worldview. Let me just take a look here. Oh, my friends, sometimes we, we hear a lot about like, um, well, what if I'm ignorant about it? Well, ignorance is, is vincible. In other words, you can overcome it by prayer and study. So study, so read, figure it out, right? There are so many issues that the Catholic Church supports or rejects. We look at capital punishment and we say maybe in some cases it's okay, but probably we should not do it to give someone a chance to repent, right? There's some wiggle room there. What about just war, right? The Catholic Church actually teaches that it's okay to fight an injustice at times, right? That there's such a thing as a just war. This comes from St. Augustine and so many others throughout history in the Catholic Church. These are saints, right? These are saints. That if we don't preserve life, we'll never have peace. This is what Pope Paul VI said. He said, if we don't have the fundamental root of, of life down, we will never have peace because it's inherently violent and contrary to peace. How... How will we look at this and say, Lord, give us the best leader according to your kingdom, even though I may not like them personally or their personality irritates me or whatever. Um, but what is the truth of their policies as compared to the Catholic Church's teaching? That's the question. Am I going to be participating in a moral evil by by voting for someone who promotes the enshrinement in law against the common good for an intrinsic evil to be upheld. Whoa. We have to pay attention, right? The intrinsic evils are very clear. They're the three non-negotiables. Anything contrary to those three non-negotiables, we got to get rid of. We've got to vote for a better candidate, right? So, I hope that through this, there was one other thing I wanted to talk about. I love this quote from Christi Fidelis Leci by Pope Paul II, Pope John Paul II. The inviolability of the person, which is a reflection of the absolute inviolability of God finds its primary and fundamental expression in the inviolability of human life. Above all, the common outcry, which is justly made on behalf of human rights, for example, the right to health, to home, to work, to family, to culture, is false and illusory. False and illusory. If the right to life, the most basic fundamental right, and the condition for all other personal rights is not defended with maximum determination. Did you hear that? Christi Fidelis Leci, number 38, Nancy, number 38. So listen to this again. Above all, the common outcry, which is justly made on behalf of human rights, for example, the right to health, human rights calls, right? Human health. The right to health, the right to home, to the right to work, the right to family, to the right to culture. It's false and illusory. Calling on the rights of all the secondary things, it's false and illusory if the right to life, the first step, being having breath, um, is not defended with maximum determination. Friends, if we don't deter maximally determine to, to fight this, this, you know, complete atrocity of, of tearing apart life, then we, why are we talking about other rights first? You know, people have said to me, Father Mark, but they're going to grow up in a really tough situation. Yeah, a lot of people have grown up in tough situations. And they've turned out pretty great. They've gone through difficult things. St. Paul says that, you know, challenges and, and suffering produces endurance and endurance proving character, right? Where, where is all the proven character gone? <laughs> if we take away suffering by killing, that doesn't even make sense. We're causing the ultimate suffering by killing. 
when they could have maybe come up with something, who knows how what a treasure their life could have been, how will we vote? How will we take into account? How will we look at the fruit of the policy? Remember, Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. Stop with the smooth talk. Don't be deceived by, this, by the smooth speaking tongue of the devil, right? Remember, our battle is against principalities and powers, not each other. When we start to go after each other, it's exactly what the, Lord, what the devil wants, right? It's against principalities and powers that we're not stuck here. This is not the end for us. This is a means to the end of getting to heaven. So how are we going to ensure that this voting time, we don't participate with evil? Because I can't think of anything proportionate to abortion right now. I just can't. So how are we looking at that first? And then looking at and working towards, maybe we, maybe we look at the pro-life and then we say, how can I help this person, you know, once in office or something, to come closer to the rights afforded to others for work and et cetera, et cetera, by writing to them, by working as an advocate, right? Not thinking somehow every issue is equal or that a bundle of these rights sudden, suddenly outweigh the right to life. No, the right to life will always outweigh every other issue because no other issue matters without life. So I hope that this was helpful. It was heavily focused on on the right to life, but it's because it's so important. And I want you to know for your own moral and spiritual well-being that I don't want you to have to figure out that you participated with an evil. So I will take questions now. I saw a few here. Um, I saw one from Meredith. Does endorsement matter? As in, what if someone is endorsed as pro-life, but their methods are ineffective and a candidate who isn't endorsed can affect change that re that achieves the same goal. Okay. I don't know what you're saying here, Meredith, but I think you're saying that what if I feel like I can't vote for this guy or this girl, but this other one is, is doing something that like uh, is pro-abortion and I can't get behind them. Uh, sometimes people think, should I just vote for like a third party? Well, your vote matters, right? Your vote matters. Um, sometimes we have this idea, what am I? I'm just one vote among many, right? Yeah, but what if it's a small margin of difference between the two? Then your vote really matters. If you're trying to throw your vote away because you're afraid someone might change or something or might, you might be participating in evil the other way, remember the hierarchy of weight and needs and remember that um, don't throw the vote away. Don't just think, oh, I'm just going to throw it away. Say, how could I maximally impact the common good here, right? According to my Catholic Christian worldview and the non-negotiables, okay? So think about that a little bit, okay? Um, Paul, I see you made a couple comments here. So, um, yep, one soul is, is so important. That's true, Paul. Um, let's see here. Sorry, I, I always take a pause at this point in the videos as I look through the comments for questions here. Um, thanks, Rita, Crystal, good to see you. Um, okay, thanks, Paul. Um, okay, uh, maybe there's someone, so sometimes people have comments. Um, I don't have my cell phone with me, so if you have a question, maybe I could go get my cell phone if you want to text me, if you have that number. I'm not going to put it out there. Um, but I'm trying to think of some other questions and concerns I've had. I, I think I covered most of the concerns. Um, you know, there's always more to talk about. There's always more to write about. Um, the best that I can do is just give you the principles that, you know, that first of all, we have to know our Catholic Christian worldview. If you don't know it, learn it. Um, the second thing would just be that I'd like you to continue to strive for, um, to discover and launch from the truth, right? The truth about our faith and the truth about the candidates. Don't settle for some little track you've heard, right? 
oh, well, so-and-so's a racist or so-and-so's an idiot or so-and-so's this or so-and-so's that. No, look it up. Look at competing news sources and try to figure it out, right? Um, how about develop a solid foundation of these cultural concepts, right? That when we talk about judgment and love and everything like that, how do we correct, etc.? Look to the scriptures, right? Look to the scriptures. Um, this is this is such a difficult, difficult thing. Um, someone said, "How do we correct our neighbors with love?" I found that asking them questions, investigating, not accusing, is often the best. That's my opinion, and I think that oftentimes, um, if we were to say, "Hey," um, I hear that you're crushed about that mistake you made back in college and it seems like you're not happy. I, I wasn't happy either until I met Jesus. Can I tell you about him? Okay. You, you hear the question. I just find that asking people questions after giving them a little piece, piece of information is sometimes more effective by letting them talk and answer questions than by you just smacking them down with tons of truth and you're going to win the argument. So, Denise, Diane, I wanted to, uh, to let you know, and hi from South Dakota, Denise uh, Knight. I'm so glad you're here. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, hang on. Yeah, friends, there's, there's a lot going on today, right? There's a lot going on, and it can make us very nervous I, I want you to just trust in the Lord, okay? That's my closing comment. Trust in the Lord. Trust that He's got us. Trust that as we co pray with confidence, think about all the times that He has come through for you. The Lord is our mighty champion, right? He's faithful and true. And let's put all of our faith and trust in Him. If we've had faith and trust in politicians, Let's vote according to our Christian principles. Let's stop looking at all the lies, deceit, and let's start really researching the truth about our own view, the truth about the candidates, and also voting according to the non-negotiables for sure, and then working to, to, to achieve the rights for all as we go forward, right? Let's just... Let's just keep this in mind as some solid principles that we're obligated to vote, that we have to vote according to our well-formed Christian worldview. We have to work for the common good. When any one individual or group is systematically excluded, especially enshrined in law, then we've got a big problem, a big problem. So seek and find the truth and focus on the fruits, the policies, not the not the personality. I hope that that was helpful for you. It looks like it probably was. I hope. I'm sure some people have different views on things. But just remember, I want to spare you. I don't want you to participate in evil. This could be a horrible thing for you spiritually or personally and, and even societally. Let's trust in the Lord, realizing that our ladies got us, right? Our Lord's got us. And that um, if we work for the common good according to our Christian Catholic worldview, it's going to be okay. Okay? All right. No of my prayers. It looks like there's no more comments or questions. Please feel free to add them in later, okay? All right. You know I love you and I'm praying for you. Please pray for me. Okay. God bless you. Bye-bye.